Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, last year, some of you might have been or had seen, um, I did a presentation on marking samplers. And my great discovery during um, that was that reading and writing um, in early colonial America or even before that, that writing was not taught. Um, writing was only taught if you were the right social class, profession, and gender. Translated, that means male, upper class, and you had a specific profession that required writing. Think business, medical, preachers, they would write. And it boiled down to boys learn to write, girls learn to sew, okay? And this would continue up until um, post-Civil War into the 1860s and 70s, okay? So, how did we get there? Oops, we got there too fast. Um, <laughs> cuneiform tablets started about 4000 BC. They were written on clay tablets with a stylus. Tablet, stylus, everything old's new again, I guess. Um, but they were mostly actually accounting records, and that's about 4000 BC. By 3000 BC, we're all familiar with Egyptian hieroglyphics. There were over 700 symbols, okay? They were chiseled in stone initially, but later they were written on papyrus, which was a type of reed, a marsh reed. Um, and this is, uh, papyrus is the root word for paper. And they would use um, a reed brush on it, okay? Now, this is where it gets connected. So this is Egyptian symbol for ox, and an ox, in Egyptian is elf, ooh, elf, okay? Well, the Phoenicians were the first, about 1000 BC, they were the first to develop an alphabet that represented sounds, okay? And they thought, well, elf is an interesting sound, and they kind of simplified the symbol for an elf, which was an ox originally, into this Phoenician symbol. The Greeks continued with this sound, they uh, modified it even a little more, and by 100 AD, the Romans made a capital A, which we would all recognize today. And almost all of the entire Roman letters have a similar ancestry of how they came to be, okay? Um, the spread of the Roman alphabet was because of the spread of the Roman Empire, right? They were all over the place. They had 23 letters, J, U, and W would be added around the 16th century. It was all caps, no lowercase. And any alphabet that's all caps is called majuscule, which means it's only uppercase, okay? There were no punctuation marks. And what's amazing here, in the 21st century, 36% of the world's population still use the Roman alphabet. Is that amazing? Chinese is a distant second. It's amazing. But at the time of the Roman alphabet um, being developed, only 15% of ancient Romans could write. And most people were dependent on scribes or professional penmen. And this would actually continue up until well into the 18th century, okay? Roman Uncial. Uncial was kind of the basic capital. It's a majuscule, all caps. But they started to write these letters. So if, if the big letter was this big, they started doing a half size. It was the same character, but it was only half the size. And this would be called Roman half Uncial. And this half Uncial is what's going to develop into what we would call lowercase. Make sense? Okay, so with um, the rise of the Roman Empire, by the 700s, there were many variations in writing styles and all that. And it was making it very hard to read. So in about year um, 800, um, Charlemagne decided to order a standard written hand, and it's Carolingian minuscule. So this is now the official handwriting, okay? Minuscule means that there's both uppercase and lowercase. Minuscule refers to lowercase. This particular writing, and you can see there's lowercase here, there's um, uppercase, but this writing would slowly morph into what we would recognize as Gothic or black letter. 
Um, think, think the monasteries, Book of Kells, that. And later, this would also be the root of German Fraktur, okay? Okay, let's talk about writing tools for just a minute. What do you write on? Well, as I said, papyrus, a marsh plant. Um, parchment would come into fashion. That was an untanned skin, usually of a sheep or a goat. But the highest quality was vellum. And vellum was a, a partially preserved calf skin, okay? For ink, the, the recipe for pink is pigment in a vehicle, okay? This usually means soot in gelatin, oil, glue, tree sap, vinegar, something of that nature, okay? But the main thing is quills. Quills would be our, our major writing tool from the sixth into well into the 19th century. Okay, here we go. So quills are made from swan or goose feathers. If you really needed to do fine work, you would use a crow feather. But it's very specific that it's the left wing feather. And I thought, oh, come on. <laughs> then they went on to explain, think the left wing. It's going to be curved, right? So when you would pick that up, it would curve over your hand nicely. Made sense, OK? <laughs> Here's the problem. Making a quill is incredibly time consuming. To make with your pen knife, that's where that comes from, OK? And worse than that, they wear out really quickly. Someone who writes a lot, a quill would only last one or two days. And it takes hours to make it. Um, if you were in lighter use, uh, it might last a week. And then there you are making your quill again, OK? But the writers started to, um, to notice that quills would last longer if you didn't pick them up and put them down between letters and they start connecting the letters. See where we're headed with this? Make sense? Okay. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't right here put this little side note. The printing press. This is a replica of the Gutenberg press from 1440. Um, it was done in the 1900s, 1990s for um, a museum, and it's based on woodcuts from the actual era. The first printing press, no. First printing press was invented in China in 800 AD. <gasps> movable type, no. First movable type was 1100 in China. Okay, this is what I will concede to Gutenberg. The Roman alphabet does lend itself much easier to movable type than Chinese does, okay? And we talk about uppercase and lowercase, okay. In movable type, you kept it in a, like a tray, a case, and you didn't use as much uppercase, so you put it up here, and you had to reach up for it, but the lowercase was down here. So that's where we get uppercase and lowercase. Ah, I love it, ah, okay. Um, Gutenberg's ink was soot mixed with linseed oil. You would think it'd have to be a little bit, um, uh, I don't know, visc viscosity is important. And by this time, paper is being made, but with cloth rags, okay? The printing press does improve reading because there's just a lot more things to read, but it doesn't boost writing at all among the population. Scribes aren't needed as much, but um, they're still needed, and some will become writing masters, okay? This is English courthand, okay? This, um, scribes were needed to transcribe legal proceedings, and they developed a type of shorthand uh, to quickly do this. Um, but later, this would morph and become used for legal documents, okay? And this would be from about 1400 to 1700. Um, if you look at it, you can see the pony. So this is an A, lowercase a, B, but as you can see, it's pretty hard to read. Ultimately, this would start being used by lawyers. And um, uh, it's so hard to read, as you can see. And people couldn't read legal papers. And this led to the mistrust of lawyers. <laughs> ah, yeah, yeah. An outcropping of legal hand is secretary hand. This goes from about the 15th to the 17th centuries. Um, it's basically a cursive 
uh, business hand. It's called secretary hand because it's used by professional copyists, scribes, secretaries. Um, I, I keep looking at it thinking, I can read this, and no, I can't. Um, part of the problem is I's and J's are the same letter, and U's and V's are the same letter. But also, you've got to remember, a English was notorious for lack of standardization in spelling, right? And so it, 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 there's very strange spellings in this. But this is secretary hand. OK, Isaac Watts, tachigraphy. And I'm going to, you can come up here after and take a look at this picture. Um, this was a present from George Minix, uh, who was the first curator here, to my spouse. And it's um, Isaac Watts' type of shorthand. Isaac Watts lived from 1674 to 1748. He was an English congregational minister, but he was mostly known now for his hymns. He wrote thousands of hymns. Um, the one you might have heard of is, Oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, or what's that Christmas one? Oh yeah, Joy to the World. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. Um, but these are actually sermon notes, and this is the actual paper he wrote on, okay? Um, these are sermon notes using tachigraphy, okay? So um, you're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards. Okay, so let's come up a couple centuries. By the 1640s, the French were using what was called ronde hand, and the English changed the word into round hand. So this is English round hand. And this was what would be used in the 17th and 18th centuries. And this is what would have been, been used in the American colonies, OK? Now, I guarantee most of you have seen English hand. In fact, I hope all of you have seen English round hand because of this guy, Timothy Matlack. Um, he was a beer brewer and a politician from Pennsylvania and a well-known master of penmanship. And from July 19 to August 2, 1776, he penned the Declaration of the Independence. Okay? Okay. It is done on vellum. Um, and this is a copy of what the, this is the original document itself. There was only one handwritten copy. It was signed. Unfortunately, well, whatever, they folded it, they, um, it became stained, it was in water, it was fading, it was taken on a tour so all the colonies could see that it had actually been um, signed and everything, but it was in really, and it still is very rough shape, in fact, um, it's pretty illegible. But in the um, early 1800s, um, they decided that they really needed to make a copy of it. And if this looks more like what you've seen, you have seen what's called a copper plate copy. Um, it's an engraved copy on a plate of copper, hence copper plate. It was made in the 1820s, and they printed in 1823 about 200 copies, OK? There are about 20 some known to still exist. Now, one thing I want to mention is I'm, I'm using copper plate. Some people think of copper plate as a handwriting. And it's not. Copper plate is what you engrave to copy English round hand, OK? But some calligraphers will refer to round hand as copy pl cop copper plate, OK? But just, you know, just want to clarify that. In the meantime, writing tools improve again. By 1800, metal nibs are starting to be produced. <laughs> In England, they're hideously expensive, and they're still kind of mad at us. So it's a little hard to get a metal nib, but they do exist, OK? Um, expensive, but um, durable. And the other thing, and this astonished me, but fountain pen pens were introduced in 1827. Again, very expensive, and they really wouldn't come into fashion until much later. By 1850, papers being made from wood pulp. So, 1800 arrives, Platt Rogers Spencer is born in New York in Dutchess County. And Platt Rogers Spencer had two passions. He loved the beauty of nature, and he loved handwriting. And by the ripe old age of 15, he began teaching penmanship. He later would become a clerk and a bookkeeper. He publishes his first... Uh, book in 1848. He actually started a school in 1840. 
and he comes up with the Spencerian alphabet. Isn't it beautiful? It's gorgeous. Um, he uses a metronome, its whole arm exercises, it's flowery, it's lots of embellishment, flourishes. Um, it encourages individualism. Think this is the era of transcendentalism, right? Okay. Um, and contrast this to the stoic English round hand, right? This is very flourishy. He bases it on seven principles. The four, first four lowercase are straight line, right curve, left curve, and extended loop. And then the last three are um, for uppercase, the direct oval. It's a capital O, okay? Reversed oval and a capital stem. And in his book, um, he talks about perfect practice words, and one of them is little, little, little. And by the way, the Spencerian, you can still buy it. And I actually I was on Amazon and found it, and it's at the back if you want to take a look at it, okay? Okay, Spencerian style is going to last throughout the entire 19th century, but it still exists today. Have you been to the grocery store? Coca-Cola. <laughs> Classic, classic, classic Spencerian, okay? The story behind it is 1885, they needed a name for a new product. The clerk in the office, Frank Mason Robinson, is they're, you know, spreading out names and he's writing down the suggestions. They look at the list and this is how he wrote it. Classic Spencerian. And it, it, it tickles me because if I'd been the clerk in the office, you know, the new product's name would have been, you know, <laughs> my, my handwriting is not good. The other one that you would have probably recognized, do you recognize the Ford? Um, this is the 1911 um, logo. There's kind of different versions. They claim that it's based on Henry Ford's signature. He probably did write Spencerian. Um, can't prove it. But the classic Spencerian is that R. That, that's really showing the R. Okay, so we're up into the 1800s. New technologies are coming um, on board. Um, this is Samuel Morse's um, picture of a prototype telegraph from 1837. The first telegraphic message would be sent in 1844, and the telegraph or that technology will be used well into the 20th century. Here's the snag. Telegraphs are faster than clerks can write, especially with Spencerian, right? There's a second thing that's going to happen. Do you know what it is? It's, a, it's, a pro, it's the prototype typewriter. And I'm so hands-on. I just, I just want to try it, you know, because it's just like, it's, it just intrigues me. But this is 1865. Now we're getting into the end of the Civil War. Public schools are starting to teach handwriting to both boys and girls, especially up north, the south a little behind. Um, and business schools are starting to spring up. And what I can tell you is by 1880, a typist could type faster than write. Okay, that is important. But what's, um, this is an 1897 Underwood one. And it's a little hard to see, but it is a QWERTY. So we had figured that part out by then. By, um, uh, business schools are coming into mode. And interestingly, Women can write, and women are allowed to enter the workforce as typists, okay? So this is getting important, okay? Um, it's late 1800s, era of business of America is business. Speed is important to business. It is, it is even now, right? We needed faster, simpler, legible, standard handwriting. And Spencerian is now being perceived as too frou-frou, too feminine, needlessly frivolous. So here's our man. Austin Norman Palmer. He publishes his first. Oh, I hear. Oh, yeah, I know the Palmer method. Yeah, I know. <laughs> he publishes his first book in 1894. It's consistent, legible, and fast. No flourishes. Um, but his big break comes in 1904, St. Louis World's Fair. The assistant superintendent of New York City schools happens to see a demonstration of Palmer method, and they adopt it for the New York City school system. And four years later, 300,000 New York students are using it, okay? And so this will be the standard method of the first half of the 20th century. 
Um, it, it's muscle movement, lots of drills, but it is advertised that it develops discipline and character and can even reform juvenile delinquents. <laughs> I'm not making this up, guys. <laughs> This is a, a page out of the Palmer Method book, and I know you can't see this, but that bottom line says, a few minutes in the right way are worth more than hours of practice the wrong way. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Okay, so this is in through 1950. Um, this is Zainer Blosser, and for, uh, you guys are, we're all kind of on the cusp between these, although this is the one I, I learned. Zainer Blosser is released late 1950, early 60, which is about the same time as ballpoint pens are starting to be around. Um, Zainer Blosser is important because it was the first um, curriculum to teach print and then go on to cursive, okay? So this is the cursive. Um, version of Zener Blosser. Zener Blosser is still around today. I can prove it. This is the prize winning hi, uh, handwriting of fifth grader from the Zener Blosser National Handwriting Contest in 2021. Wow. Zener Blosser is still around today. Yeah. Audience participation time. Everybody hold up your hand that you write with. I'm not kidding. Okay, okay, okay. Remember writer's bump on the middle finger? How many of you still have your writer's bump? Yeah, there will be no lefty shaming, by the way. Okay, okay, yeah. Remember that? You, and you would get, it was kind of a rite of practice, uh, 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 about fifth grade or so? Yeah, yeah, do you remember that? Oops, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I was, I, it made me laugh when I was thinking about um, writer's bump. This one I didn't know about, and this is really new. This is called Denelian. It was developed in the 1970s by Donald Neil Thurber. He was from Michigan, interestingly, and he was a primary school teacher. And his thing was he thought that the transition from print to cursive need to be easier. And so if you look, he's got these little tails on things, okay? And so... Uh, yeah, it does have a little italic to it, yeah. And then this is his cursive. So the cursive is more like print, okay? So I wanted to show you. This is Zainer Blosser. It's very up and down, and the Zainer Blosser cursive is completely different from the, from the printing. Denilian printing is at a slant, and then all you're doing is connecting the tails, okay? So... Now, and I can tell you that 90% of public schools in the U.S., if they teach writing, will use either Zainer Blosser or um, Denelian. They're both still very around today. And just as a further comparison, so this is Spencerian, Palmer, Zainer Blosser, and Denelian, okay? Um, you can tell these three very, very, very similar, okay? So what is the future of cursive? Well, public schools in the late 1990s to early 2000, um, what the trend was was they would teach first and second graders to print. By third grade, they would learn keyboarding because of computers. Another major one, um, in 2005, the College Board, which administers the SAT test, added an optional essay writing component and they first gave it in 2006. And the College Board reported the first time they gave it, 15% of the participants wrote in cursive. 85% printed their essays. And the sad thing to me about that is that the, the, the cursive writers would be your bright, this is your brightest and best that are taking the essays because they were not required, okay? Um, I was an a instructor at the Elkhart Area Career Center from 1990 to 2020. By 2010, I could not write in any cursive, whether I was writing on the board or giving feedback on homework. And I was also an adjunct professor, and it was the same with my college students at that point. Okay? Okay, here's one. Mentioning my topic, because, you know, me talking. Uh, um, uh, to, a, to a dollar to a donut... And everybody would say, oh my gosh, I, I wrote this sweet little card, this little note to my grandchild, and they opened it up, 
and they couldn't read it. How many of you have had that happen? Yeah, yeah. You, if you don't learn cursive, you, don't, you can't read it, which is really sad. Bankers and notaries are saying that most people under 30 now print their name. They do not have a cursive signature. Okay. Um, preschool teachers also are noting that children are losing fine motor skills because they're playing on computers or a, a, a smartphone or something. Um, they're not coloring with crayons. They're not scribbling with pencils. They're losing fine motor skills. But the biggest standard that I want to mention is because we're a mobile society, the U.S. Department of Education decided that we need common core. What it wanted was to establish if I moved from Alaska to Alabama with my third grader that all third graders would be doing basically the same thing. And it was called the Common Core and it was published in uh, 2010. The Common Core in 2010 included keyboarding. It did not include or mandate the teaching of cursive writing. Okay. Now, I looked this up because I was real intrigued by this. In 2023, by the end of 2023, 24 states now do have some cursive. And what the model is seems to be uh, first and second grade is printed, third grade some cursive, fourth grade keyboarding. Okay. 24 states now include some cursive, but not Indiana. Um, if... If you're a Luddite like me and still get the Elkhart truth, but this is from Thursday, December 14, and it was the, the writing on the wall. And there is a led, uh, some legislation going through Indiana that is trying to mandate um, cursive handwriting now. It still has not gone through, and I'm not sure if it will or not, but we may be adding that. Okay. Okay. Um, So what is the future of cursive? This is the Declaration of Independence, the rough draft by Jefferson, and then when you see the um, modifications, it's, it's by Benjamin Franklin. Um, our kids won't be able to re read it. Is it necessary? Um, is it necessary to actually um, read a primary document like the Gettysburg Address on the back of an envelope? I don't know, but I do know that if you don't learn cursive, you won't be able to read it. I want to read you just a little paragraph here for my end. And uh, let me read this to you. This is Sam Levinson. It's one in, era, in one era out the other, OK? There is something deep within me that resists and resents the chore of filling out bureaucratic questionnaires with crosses, checks, and circles, especially when I think of all the years I labored and of all the conscientious teachers who labored with me to improve my penmanship via the Palmer method. A system cultivating beautiful circles and oblique strokes guaranteed to give my handwriting the elegance of a papal secretary's. I remember the hours I was kept after school to get the curse out of my cursive writing. As the sun went down, I sat there rounding and slanting on pages of lined yellow paper to the rhythm of the teacher's sing song. Round and round and round we go, elbow off the table, wrist off the table, up and down, push, pull, rounder, rounder, rounder. Thank you. <laughs>